Chapter One of the Adventures of Diggledy Dan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Brennan. The Adventures of Diggledy Dan by Edwin P. Norwood. Chapter One in which Dan meets the pretty lady with the blue, blue eyes. Had you tiptoed to the very edge of a certain town on a certain day not so very long ago, you would have come upon a great sprawling cluster of big and little tents, and had you held your breath and walked ever so quietly, you would have finally have reached an open space in the very centre of the bigger tents, where stood a small white tent that seemed far more interesting than all the rest. Just why it seemed so would have been hard to tell, unless it was because, though there was not so much as a thimbleful of wind astir, a certain spot in its canvas wall kept bulging in and out, after the fashion of a curtain in the breeze. At times this spot would settle back into place, only to start jiggling a moment later, just as though there was someone inside the tent clutching at its wall and shaking it, much as a monkey rattles the bars to its cage. As for the open space between the little white tent and all the bigger circus tents, for the tents were all a part of Spangle Land, there was no sign of life. True, there were gaily dressed men scattered about here and there, and women too, but all were fast asleep. Some lay back in low canvas chairs, strung in a row in the shadow of the tents. Some with their chins propped in their hands, were perched like pigeons on the tongues of wonderful red and golden wagons, while still others lay at full length on the cool green grass. The lap of one was covered by a newspaper, and that of another held an open book, just as if their owners had grown weary of reading and dozed off to sleep, square in the middle of a sentence. So there was no sign of life, except the jiggling of the wall of the round white tent that stood in the centre of all the bigger tents. Meantime the day was fast making ready for bed, indeed the sun was just on the point of slipping out of sight behind the very largest of all the bigger tents when far off in the sky to the west there appeared a tiny black speck and at this wall of the round white tent began to jiggle more violently than before while a wee little eye appeared peeking through a wee little hole in its wall and as the wee eye watched the speck grew in size and then began to describe little curves as if it were bounding up and down as it came, and for that matter so it was, for the speck was a bird on the wing, and it was headed straight for the tents of Spangle Land. On it came, until it had reached the very edge of the circus town, and then it began to bound up and down even more than before, and to circle this way and that, as if to make sure of some certain thing of which it alone knew the secret. But it flew more slowly now, so that one might have seen, had any been there to see, that its colour was a wondrous blue, and of so a gorgeous hue that the red and golden wagons, which were just at that moment struck by the sun's parting rays, must have felt very much ashamed of themselves. Finally, as if no longer in doubt, the bird fixed its eyes on the little white tent, and flew straight to the wee hole in its wall, and as it reached the tent it began to call in the softest voice imaginable, Oh Dan, Dan, Diggledy Dan, Oh, Dan, Dan, Diggledy Dan. While from behind the wall of the round white tent came the merriest of voices in reply, singing almost as softly, Here's Dan, Dan, Diggledy Dan. Here's Dan, Dan, Diggledy Dan. Then said the bird, who had by this time perched itself on the noose of one of the little round poles that stuck out near the caves of the round white tent, Come forth at once, sir and at this command the canvas wall of the round white tent was parted by the very hands of one who had been jiggling it in his impatience to put it aside, and little by little, as if he feared that those who slept might awaken, there appeared the funniest little old man in all the world. First came his head, all white and smooth and crowned by a queer round hat that came to a point at the top, and his ears were white too, and so was his face, except for his red, red lips, and five curious spots of red, one on his chin, one on his brow, one on each cheek, and one on the tip of his long, funny nose. He wore a collar that was all ruffled and round, and a baggy white suit trimmed with great polka-dot patches that might have been likened to very red apples, except for the fact that half of them were blue. 
Come, come, make haste there, Dan, if indeed you are Diggledy Dan, cried the bird from its perch on the little round pole. Quite so, quite so, chuckled the funny old man, and suiting himself to his words, he made a quick skip into the open, danced three steps to the left and three to the right, and then doffing his queer sugar-loafed hat, made a very grand curtsy in the direction of the bird, saying as he did so, At your service, little messenger. Ah, then you know who I am, exclaimed the one who had come out of the west, but I must be very sure, so tell me if you can, what rhymes with this? Oh, Dan, Dan, diggledy Dan. Why, answered the clown, for you must have guessed that he was a clown. Why, he repeated, you are the courier from Tu Botan. But though the bird nodded in approval, as if to say, yes, yes, that is correct, it still seemed reluctant to admit that the man was really diggledy Dan, so it put its head first to one side and then to the other and puckered its very blue brows, as if thinking up some further test, and then it spoke again. Diggledy Dan, if indeed you are Diggledy Dan, who was it told you the last line of the rhyme? Why, answered the clown with great readiness, it was the pretty lady with the blue, blue eyes. She came to me in a dream last night, riding her white, white horse through the skies. She wakened me, or at least I thought she did, by tickling my nose with her slim little whip. She said, tomorrow, after the circus is over, and the great crowd has gone home to its supper, and after the people of the circus have had their suppers, and are come back to the shady places, in and about the big and little tents, to read and tell their tales, and take their ease, they will all fall into a very deep sleep, that is, all but diggledy Dan. And at this the clown paused to take a much-needed breath, for he had become somewhat excited in telling his story, and to speak the truth, had quite forgotten to breathe between sentences. But at a sign from the bird he went on. As for you, Dan Dan Diggledy Dan, continued the pretty lady with the blue blue eyes, you will not go to sleep. Instead you are to hide in the round white tent that stands in the centre of all the bigger tents, and wait for the messenger who will come out of the west. And then she told me the rhyme, for tomorrow, she said, you'll have been a clown for a hundred years and a day. Yes, that was just what she said, a hundred years and a day, and so I have been. But what of that, my pretty bird? For see, I still can dance as merrily and as lightly as any butterfly that flitters over the fields in the May. As if to prove what he had said, the funny old clown tipped off so very blithely and so very fast that he bumped smack into one of the red and golden wagons that stood in the lee of the round white tent. Aha, said the bird, half to itself and hardly seeming to notice that the bump into the wagon had sent the clown to the grass on his back. You will do, diggledy Dan, you will do. And, with that, it flew from its perch at the top of the little round pole while in a very twinkling there appeared the most beautiful circus lady one ever laid eyes upon, and with her a white white horse right out of the sky, so that when Dan picked himself up, and lifting one foot was just about to finish his dance, his red red lips fell very apart and his eyes became almost as large as the polka dot patches that covered his white baggy suit. Indeed he presented so comical an appearance, standing there with one foot in the air, and I starring his visitor, most out of countenance, that the lady leaned forward on her white white horse and burst into so merry a laugh that it sounded like all the silver tinkle bells in the world. Why, exclaimed Dan, when he had finally found his voice and put down his foot, you are the pretty lady with the blue blue eyes. Yes, and the blue bird too for it was I, all the while, and now, diggledy Dan, if you will be so good as to come with me to the very edge of Spangleland, I will tell you the message from Tu Botan. And so the pretty lady and the white white horse, with Dan walking by their side, passed slowly along between the big and little tents, speaking not at all, while the clown kept wondering what it was he was so soon to hear. End of chapter 1, recording by Amelia Brennan Chapter 2 of The Adventures of Diggledy Dan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. 
The Adventures of Diggledy Dan by Edwin P. Norwood. Chapter 2 In which Dan hears the message from Tubotan. Now, when the pretty lady with the blue blue eyes had reached the very outer edge of Spangleland, she brought her white white horse to a pause. And Diggledy Dan paused too. There they stood, forming a picture for all the world like one you must have seen in a storybook. Only it was much more wonderful than that could ever be, for no artist could ever have quite caught the blue in the lady's eyes or the gold that lay in her hair. For oddly enough, her yellow curls gleamed, though by this time the twilight had come and the lights of the night began to blink and to wink away off in the streets of the town. Then the pretty lady began to speak. Dan, for now I know you are Diggledy Dan. What is in this great white tent that stands so near where we stand? Why, answered Dan, there's monkeys and lions and tigers and things, and quite so, the lady broke in. It, then, is the tent that we want. Now listen to me with both your funny white ears and with all your two twinkling eyes. For this is the message from Tubotan to all the animals of Spangleland. Beginning on the morrow and on every day thereafter, there is to come a wee little hour in the twilight when all the monkeys and lions and tigers and things are to be let out of their cages, allowed to dance and to play and do as they will. But, oh, pretty lady, that will not do at all, burst in Diggledy Dan. Their cages are locked. There's no hour to spare, and, and maybe they'd eat folks up. But for answer, the lady only laughed, the laugh that was so like the tinkle bells. <laughs> Have no fear, Diggledy Dan. All that has been thought out by far wiser heads than yours. You see, it was this way. Ever so long ago, Tubotan, who is the very biggest monkey in all the world, called a meeting of all the animals in faraway jungle land. And when they had gathered on the highest peak of the mountains, where Tubo holds his wonderful court, Tubo rose and made this very solemn speech. It was, as many of you know, the very dearest wish of my honored father, Vargu, that the day might come when something could be done to make easier the lot of our fellow animals who have so nobly sacrificed their freedom and consented to spend their lives in red and golden cages that the children may have their circus days of late i have had my learned counselors go into this matter very thoroughly and they have found but yesterday written on the face of a great stone in the depths of a certain cave in a certain mountain this remarkable decree on the day when diggledy dan has been a clown for a hundred years and a day as a reward for the great joy that he has given little children through all his merry life he will be granted the privilege of releasing all animals from their cages at every setting of the sun and so continued tubotan looking out from under his bushy eyebrows this meeting of all the animals has been called that we may discover just who this diggledy dan may be where he is and most important of all whether he has yet been a clown for a hundred years and a day but interrupted dan as the pretty lady reached this point in her story i've been here with the circus for ever and ever and ever so long of course you have agreed the lady but you see tubotan has been so busy with other matters that he didn't know that you had but i knew for i am the fairy of the circus the one who watches over all the riders and all the clowns and all the people of the big and little tents the one who knows just what each one of them does every single day and so when tubo had finished speaking i jumped to my feet and i said i could find you in no time at all then we waited until the hour should come when you had been a clown for a hundred years and a day and when it came i at once called for my white white horse and as you know came through you through the skies as you slept 
and now for the hour grows late and you will soon be needed in the very biggest tent to laugh and to dance and to play all your pranks let us be quick to-morrow at half-past twilight when when do you say puzzled dan at half-past twilight repeated the lady which reminds me that i have a watch for you that you may be very sure of the hour a very precious watch fashioned from the petals of a great white flower that never blossoms except when the twilight comes and then only for a wee short hour even as she spoke the pretty lady tugged at a silver thread that lay in the maze of the mane of her white white horse and presently there appeared from the opposite side of her snowy mount the queerest looking watch that ever told time it was as round as a pancake but not one quarter as thick indeed it seemed to have no thickness at all this said the lady as she unhooked the thread is the petal watch you are to keep it tucked away in the peak of your round funny hat and each evening just at half-past twilight it will open and put forth its petals and then you will know it is time to let loose the monkeys and tigers and lions and things and as dan taking the watch knelt down to fold it away in the crown of his hat there came a great burst of music from the very biggest of all the bigger tents at the sound of it the white white horse began to prance and then the pretty lady's curls set flying by the speed of his gallop was off through the night to the west for a moment diggledy dan made as if to follow then he turned and holding his hat very tightly as if fearing he might lose the watch that was to be so useful on the morrow he skipped away toward the great tent from whence the music came singing as he ran End of chapter two chapter three of the adventures of diggledy dan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the adventures of diggledy dan by edwin p norwood chapter three in which dan releases the animals of spangleland as the sun sank to rest behind the tents of spangleland on the day following the visit of the pretty lady with the blue blue eyes it paused for a moment as the sun sometimes will and shot one last long lingering beam towards the little white tent which as you will remember played a part in the beginning of this tale had you been near at the time and possessed some knack at riding sunbeams you might have mounted this one and ridden straight through the wee open place that served as a peephole for the wee little eye when the blue bird was first seen in the west for it was through this tiny chink that the sunbeam passed and having gained entrance landed plump on the nose of diggledy dan indeed it came so suddenly that the clown who sat hunched over on the top of a gaily painted box lost in deep thought mistook it for a bright yellow bee and tried to brush it aside and then he saw his mistake and sitting up very straight glanced upward to the hole in the wall oh ho little sunbeam so you've come to remind me he cried yes yes now i will put on my hat and wait for the petal watch to tell me the time as he did so he noticed that just as before all those who were near him were quite fast asleep and looking up and then down the inside of the tent at all the many clowns that had been packed off to slumberland and all the queer coloured thingamajigs and all the odd doodads that clowns always keep near he waited for a sign from the watch he did not wait long for soon he felt something tickling the top of his smooth white head and removing his hat ever so carefully there he saw exactly as the pretty lady had promised the unfolding petals of a wonderful flower surely now reasoned dan it must be half past twilight so slipping down from the box he tiptoed in and out through the sleeping forms passed to the open space between the little white tent and all the bigger tents picked his way among the gaily dressed men and the women who drowsed in the chairs or lay stretched on the grass and once clear of them skipped away as fast as ever his two legs would carry him in the direction of the great tent where lived the monkeys and tigers and lions and things reaching its entrance he spied all the keepers leaning against the poles of the tent but they too were asleep their chins buried deep on their breasts then he advanced to the very centre of the vast circle formed by all the red and golden cages and at the sight of this funny old clown in the polka-dot suit there went up such a cry from the animals that for the moment 
Diggory Dan was tempted to skip away even faster than he had come, for never had he heard any such shout, which, but for the fact that the people of the circus were in a very deep sleep, must have wakened every one of them. But the keepers slept on, and soon Dan came to realise that the voices were joining in a sort of chant. Putting his head to one side, he listened ever so intently, and then a great smile broke over his face, for gradually the chant took form. Yes, it was quite distinct now. The animals were shouting, in almost as many keys as there were voices, Dan, Dan, Diggledy Dan, 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 Diggledy Dan. And, looking about from cage to cage, Dan saw that all of the animals were standing, their eyes shining, their faces flushed, their mouths working gleefully in the song that sang his name. Then, almost as quickly as it had begun, the chant ended, and all was as quiet as the hush of the twilight. Well, well, began Dan, making four separate bows, one to the north, one to the east, one to the south, and the last to the west. You seem to know who I am. Of course we do, answered the mighty chorus. You're Dan, Dan, Diggledy Dan. We've been expecting you the whole day. And who, if I may make bold to ask, told you to expect me? Why, came the shout, it was a little bird. A bird? Never mind the rest, interrupted Dan. I might have guessed without asking. It was the bluebird, of course. So we'll lose no time in retelling old stories, but get down to business at once. And, that he might not be accused of playing favourites, in so far as which animal should be the first to be let out of its cage, the old clown put his feet together, raised himself to the very tips of his toes, shut his eyes very tightly, spun around exactly seven times, and then, with his eyes still closed, followed the end of his long, funny nose until it had brought him to the door of that cage which was nearest it. And, opening the door and his eyes at the very same moment, Diggledy Dan came face to face with Lion. Lion, said Dan, as he took one of the big fellow's paws in both his hands. I am sure that this nose of mine showed extremely good sense in leading me first of all to your door. And now we will take the cages as they come. So Dan, accompanied by Lion, went to the gilded home of Tiger. Then the three of them passed on to that occupied by Leopard, and so on around the great circle, until every single one of the animals had been loosed from its cage. With Dan in the lead, they formed a long winding line, and then, the serpentine entirely complete, moved forward, for all the world like a troop of children playing at lockstep. Round and round they marched, swaying from side to side and singing at the very tops of their voices, with Dan tossing his head from right to left like the drum major in a band, and holding out the sides of his baggy white trousers, just as clowns oft times do at the circus. But after the strange procession had paraded three times around the circle, Dan signalled a halt. No, no, let's do it some more, pleaded all the animals. And though he was somewhat out of breath, Dan gave consent, and off they all pranced again, making more of a din than before. But at the farther end of the great tent, the old clown clapped his hands, and the long line stopped in its tracks. And doffing his round, funny hat, Dan saw that the petal watch was all but closed. Quick, quick, there, into your cages, or we'll all be caught, he cried. Monkey, you will go in last, and, meantime, help me close all the doors. And, with Dan scurrying about, and Monkey running so very fast that he fastened two doors to the old clown's one, the task was completed in no time at all. Now, said Dan, after Monkey had been tucked away, I'll say goodbye till tomorrow, and then at half past twilight I'll come again, and we'll hold a great meeting and lay all manner of plans. In the meantime, remember, not a word to a soul. Not a word to a soul, echoed the animals in chorus. So, swinging his hat as he went, Diggledy Dan danced down the length of the menagerie tent, and then, stopping at the end of it to give a last wave to his friends, disappeared in the depths of the dusk. End of chapter 3 Recording by Julian Prattley Chapter 4 of The Adventures of Diggledy Dan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Adventures of Diggledy Dan by Edwin P. Norwood Chapter 4 In Which the Animals Elect Officers on as fine an evening as one might wish for, and at exactly seven minutes past half-past twilight by the petal watch, Diggledy Dan stood in the very centre of the great menagerie tent, 
while before him were grouped all the animals of Spangle Land. Coming from their cages and from out their corrals, or, like elephant, zebra, and camel, being unhooked from their chains by monkey and dam, they had arranged themselves much as one sees them pictured in great atlases, or on gaily coloured posters, but never, strangely enough, at the circus itself. In the front row sat Puma, Monkey, Seal, Leopard, Hyena, and Little Black Bear, and all their families. Next in order came Lion, Tiger, Ostrich, Great White Bear, Deer, Emu, Kangaroo, and their families, while ranged behind these were Elephant, Camel, Hippo, Zebra, and Rhino, and their different cousins and aunts, with Giraffe and his folks still back of them. There they sat, chattering and laughing and making quite as much of a clatter as people do at the theatre, just before the curtain goes up. Now, began Dan, pulling his hands from his pockets and clapping them together for silence. It seems to me the first thing to do is to get ourselves organised. Yes, yes, that it is, answered the merry crew. Let's do that very thing. We should begin then, continued Dan, by choosing a chairman. Who, say you, shall it be? At this all the animals began to talk at once, but as it was Tiger who seemed to be making the most noise, Dan said he should be the first to speak. Diggledy Dan and fellow animals, said Tiger, as he gravely stroked his chin with a huge paw. I rise to name one who, because of the very place that he has long held among us, is especially suited to the office of chairman. One who, because of his great strength, his fairness, and kindly disposition, has long been known as the King of Beasts. The one who, as you will remember, was the very first to be loosed from his cage. I, of course, am speaking of Lion. Hear, hear, came from all sides. Lion, of course. Who else but Lion? Let's make the choice unanimous, cried Rhino. And so, somewhat flustered, but by no means lacking in dignity, and escorted by Great White Bear and Little Black Bear, Lion came forward to accept the office to which he had been elected. My fellow animals, he said. Realising that there is still much to be done, I will be brief. First, let me thank you for the honour you have bestowed upon me, and to assure you that I will do my best to serve you. While appreciating Tiger's kindness in suggesting me for chairman, I cannot but feel that I should differ with him on one point, that is, with reference to the title The King of Beasts. That is all very well in jungle land, perhaps, but here in this great land of the free, with even ourselves set at liberty, I feel that the word king should be replaced by president. I believe that. But here cries of, That's right! Why, of course! President of beasts! And the like broke in upon the speaker, and the point was carried, even before Lion had finished his argument. Now then, Mr. King, I mean Mr. President, said Hippo, who had been holding a quiet consultation with the animals nearest him. It would seem to me that we should elect a secretary before we go any further so that an exact record may be kept of these meetings, and, in due time, sent on to our good friend, Tubotan. A very commendable thought indeed, assented Lion. Nominations are, therefore, in order for secretary. And, at this, the several animals who had had their heads together with Hippo all jumped to their feet, and began to chant, Dan, Dan, diggledy Dan! Dan, Dan, diggledy Dan! Why, of course, agreed all the rest. Who else but Diggledy Dan? I'll furnish a quill for the pen, said Ostrich. I know where there's an old circus poster with nothing at all on the back, cried Elephant, as he made off toward the end of the tent. I'll offer myself for a table, volunteered Hippo. And I'll supply the ink, said Dan, diving into one of his funny deep pockets and drawing forth a top, some chalk, three marbles, and, last of all, a bottle of very red ink. And so, almost before one might have said Jack Robinson, there sat Diggledy Dan astride Hippo's back, with the poster that Elephant had brought spread out before him, the quill that Ostrich had furnished grasped firmly in his hand, writing away for all he was worth, while all the animals crowded round, all talking at once, and each trying to remember just exactly what Tiger had said when he had nominated Lion, and just what Lion had said when he spoke in reply. Of course, all this took some little time, and, indeed, Dan concluded the first chapter of the interesting document with one eye to his work, and the other on the petal watch. And just as he had crossed the very last T, and dotted the very last I, the great white flower began to close. At the first sign of it, away scampered all the animals to their cages and corrals, while Dan, with the aid of Monkey, having locked all the doors and fastened each chain, 
scurried off to make ready for the circus, folding the precious poster and tucking it away with the petal watch as he ran. Tomorrow at half past twilight, he cried in farewell. Tomorrow, answered Lion from the depths of his cage, while from all parts of the tent came the voices that echoed, Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. End of chapter 4 Recording by Julian Prattley Chapter 5 of The Adventures of Diggledy Dan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Diggledy Dan by Edwin P. Norwood Chapter 5 In Which Giraffe Gives a Chalk Talk and the Animals Learn a New Game now when the fourth day had turned to twilight and the animals of spangle land had gathered to continue the meeting that had resulted in the election of lion as president of animals and diggledy dan as secretary zebra announced that he had a matter of much importance to bring to their attention it has to do with giraffe and his folks began zebra as he bobbed his head and flopped his long striped ears in the direction of those to whom he referred as all of us are aware neither giraffe nor any of his ancestors have ever been known to speak when we consider the great amount of talking many of us ofttimes do without really saying much i am sometimes of the opinion that our big-eyed brothers show no little wisdom by preserving strict silence still i feel that giraffe and his family should have a voice in our different discussions if they so desire and think it only fair that they be consulted as to their wishes while zebra had been speaking it was noticed that giraffe had been all attention and when lion from his place in front of all the animals asked him if he had anything to say he nodded most positively very well then giraffe we will indeed be glad to hear from you said lion as he crossed his paws and leaned back in an attitude of strict attention by this time all the eyes of all the animals were on giraffe and so were those of diggledy dan who sat astride hippo the circus poster spread out before him his pen poised in mid-air, ready to jot down any and all things that might come to pass. And, as they watched, Giraffe unfolded his long, lanky legs and, for all the world like two boys on two pairs of tall stilts, made his way from the rear of the group and walked around to the side of Diggledy Dan. Then, bending his mile-long neck, he thrust his nose into the depths of Dan's pockets. Hear, hear! cried the clown. There are no carrots there! silence dan commanded lion even at this moment giraffe removed his nose and there in the tips of his lips was the top which as you may remember the clown had drawn out when he brought forth the bottle of very red ink down went the top on the broad back of hippo and back went giraffe's nose in the pocket of dan and this time the searcher's ears began to wiggle with delight and his eyes to twinkle with glee for when his nose next came forth there held tight in his mouth was a piece of bright yellow chalk at sight of it a puzzled look crossed the faces of all those who watched it was lion who first caught the thought why of course he exclaimed with a wise nod of his head giraffe proposes to talk with the chalk with the chalk to be sure agreed puma and i know where there's a board the inner side of the strips that close up my cage are all painted black come on elephant and we'll get one right now so away the two of them went and soon elephant was holding the board high up in his trunk and as he held it in place giraffe wrote with the chalk very thoughtful of you thanks heartily agree with all done thus far giraffe and putting the chalk alongside the top he made a low swinging bow with his long spotted neck and hurried off to his place at the rear of the group amid the shouts and cheers of his fellows while the animals were cheering or telling one another just what each had been thinking when giraffe was rummaging dan's pocket the old clown's pen was going scratch 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 back and forth across the poster and now mr president said dan as he finished writing and folded up the great sheet of paper i suggest that we forget business for a time and engage in a game that i have in mind a fine idea agreed lion as indeed did all the rest in one voice that is all but giraffe and his folks they nodded their approval. It's a game called London Bridge is Falling Down, went on Dan. It was Giraffe's long neck and elephant's trunk that suggested the thought. So now, suppose we begin. Yes, let's begin, cried the animals, as they trooped into the circle that ran in front of all the red and gold cages. 
First, called Dan, you giraffe and your folks will stand opposite one another with your noses touching. There, that's the way. Now, elephant, you and your family will do the same. Only raise your trunks very high and hold them together at the tips, just as if you were shaking hands way up in the air. That's it. Fine. Now all the rest of us will go skipping down the aisle between you. So Dan, taking the lead and calling, Come on, tiger. Come on, lion. Hi there, hippo. Away they all went, down through the line. Now back again, shouted Dan, and this is the song that we'll sing as we go. London Bridge is falling down, falling down. London Bridge is falling down, 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 down. Say, hold on a minute, cried Hippo. I'm too wide. I can't get through. I'll fix that, shouted Elephant. Up now, he commanded. And at the words, all of the elephant's folk stood up on their hind legs, and Hippo passed through without any trouble at all. So the game went on, with all the animals vowing that they never had quite so much fun before in all their lives. But by this time, the pedal watch had begun to close, and, at a word from Dan and the promise that he would see them again at half-past twilight on the morrow, the merry band went back to their places. As the old clown passed out of the menagerie tent, he could still hear the voices in the distance humming the song, London Bridge is falling down, 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 down. End of chapter 5. Recording by Valentina Vicelli. Chapter 6 of The Adventures of Diggledy Dan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Diggledy Dan by Edwin P. Norwood. Chapter 6 In Which the Animals Send a Message to the Pretty Lady. And that, finished Diggledy Dan, is the story of the pretty lady with the blue, blue eyes. It was on the fifth day after she of whom Dan spoke had brought him the message from Tubutan, and, with all the animals of Spangle Land gathered about him, the old clown had been telling them of her and the blue bird. Yes, nodded Camel, she is the fairy of the circus. I have heard my father describe her. But I like the other name best, spoke up Seal, the pretty lady with the blue, blue eyes. When my family and I go into the great white tent to perform, we often catch a glimpse of the riders as they pass on their way from the rings. They are much like that, all pretty ladies with mounts like the white, white horse. I wish we could see her, mused Leopard. Let's send her a message, suggested Ostrich. But how? queried Kangaroo. We've no one to send, and, even if we had, where in the world should we send him? Diggledy Dan, said Lion, what have you to suggest? Well, answered Dan, I know this much and that is that the pretty lady went away toward the west. I like to believe that she makes her home in the sunset. Why, if that's the case, then that's not far from here, broke in Elephant. Even while Elephant was speaking, Giraffe came forward and picked up the chalk. Then striding to the side of a cage, he scrawled on its face, not far at all. Looking through Eve's space and tent, this very evening, saw sun set just back of hill, about a mile from here, Giraffe. Not more than a mile cried Tiger, only a mile. Then he paused and looked rather foolish, for how are they to reach over even a mile? I know, I know, I know, shouted Monkey, dancing up and down. Balloons, 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 that's the way, that's the— Hold on there, Monkey, interrupted Lion. Not so fast. For goodness sake, don't get so excited. Besides, I, for one, know of no balloons in this vicinity. No, no, I don't mean truly big balloons, explained Monkey. Wait a minute, and I'll show you. And away he dashed down the menagerie tent and was back in a twinkling, waving a great cluster of toy balloons over his head. Monkey, admitted Lion as he took the balloons. I must confess that your head is oft times much longer than mine. Of course you mean to write our message, tie it to the balloons, and get the east wind to carry it over the hill to the place where Giraffe saw the sun go down, finished Monkey. And then the excitement that followed. The writing of the message fell to Diggledy Dan, and, after no end of changes, all of course for the better, there appeared these words written on a corner that had been torn from the great circus poster, Dear Pretty Lady with the Blue Blue Eyes, at Sunset House, just over the hill, we all want you to visit us. We all promise to be very quiet. Please come at half-past twilight tomorrow. Signed, Animals of Spangle Land, by Diggledy Dan, Secretary. P.S. Please bring back the balloons, because they are just borrowed. P.S. 
The white, white horse is invited too. The message completed, Diggledy Dan produced a piece of string from one of his wonderful pockets, and aided by Monkey, tied all the sticks of the balloons tightly together, and then fastened the letter to the tip of the sticks. Now then, said Lion, we are ready to let loose the balloons. You, Elephant, take hold of the sticks with your trunk. You, Puma, will leap to the top of your cage and hold open the eaves of the tent with your paws so that Elephant can thrust the balloons through the space and hand them to the wind as it comes out of the east. I can make out the curve of a hill to the west, called Puma, who had jumped from the ground to the roof of the cage. Only I can't get quite high enough to see over the top. I'll be the lookout, cried Monkey. That is, if Giraffe will lend me his head to step over near the eaves of the tent. And, as Giraffe nodded assent, up the long neck he scampered and was soon perched aloft, holding tight with both hands to Giraffe's pointed ears. All right up there, called Lion from below. All ready, answered Monkey. And here comes the east wind around the side of the tent. Cast off then, Elephant, commanded Lion. Let go the balloons. At the very same moment, Elephant gave a great swish with his trunk, and away went the balloons through the space at the eaves. There they go, shouted Monkey. Up, up, up. Goodness, how they're sailing. Oh, they've caught in a tree. No, they haven't. Now the east wind has them again. Once more they're off. They're going higher and higher, and they're bound straight for the hill. Yes, straight for the brow of the hill. And so, from his perch, Monkey described every inch of the flight until... To the great relief of the animals who were grouped down below, he announced that the balloons had passed over the hill. Indeed, the word came in good time, for just then there followed a quick shout from Dan crying, Get back to your places as fast as you can! Then came a wild scurrying to right and to left. Now, I'll bid you good night, said Diggledy Dan, when the very last door had been locked. And tomorrow we'll learn if we were right when we guess that the one we have written makes her home in the West. End of chapter 6. Recording by Valentina Vicelli. Chapter 7 of The Adventures of Diggledy Dan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Diggledy Dan by Edwin P. Norwood. Chapter 7 in which the animals meet with a disappointment and a story is begun now had the sleepers who slept so soundly at the foot of the big blue poles in the great menagerie tent suddenly wakened at a little after half-past twilight on the evening following that which saw the balloons go sailing over the hill they no doubt would have rubbed their eyes pinched themselves and then exclaimed well of all things wherever can those animals be but of course they did nothing of the kind for the very good reason that not a single one of them so much as opened one eye though if they had where do you suppose they would have found all their charges away over behind the red and gold cages yes there they stood side by side in a row their noses pressed close against the west wall of the tent looking for all the world like so many catchers in a game of hide and go seek and diggledy dan was there too all had found peepholes in the canvas and through these they peered eagerly in the direction of sunset house they were watching for the lady with the blue blue eyes every one to his place lion had commanded when the merry crew had been loosed but a few minutes before and then we will see who will be the first to catch a glimpse of the one who will ride out of the west not a word from a soul until she comes into view at first it was fun but as the minutes dragged by and no movement was seen the watchers began to grow restless seals started to twist and to turn next puma's tail was seen to curl and to wave while zebra switched his with quick little jerks then hippo heaved a great sigh that must surely have been heard a whole mile away finally monkey who was never known to keep entirely quiet could stand it no longer lion he whispered no answer lion repeated monkey well what is it answered lion at last from his place near the middle of the line i i don't want to watch any longer have patience and be quiet sir ordered lion so the watch went on a minute passed and another and another then something went bang what was that demanded lion i i was standing on my tail and and went to sleep answered kangaroo in a very sheepish voice i 
I fell down and bumped my head against Rhino's cage. And it was newly varnished but yesterday, muttered Rhino. Then Monkey giggled, and that set Hyena to laughing until the tears rolled down his cheeks. Even Lion was obliged to smile, though a moment later his face took on a very serious look. Perhaps we have waited long enough, he admitted rather sadly. I fear something must have happened. What do you think, Diggledy Dan? I don't know just what to say, Lion, answered Dan. You see, I was quite sure the pretty lady made her home in the West. It is all my fault. I am very sorry. There, there, said Lion, as he placed a paw on the old clown's shoulder. Surely none of us would think of blaming you, Dan. So come, he called out to the rest. Let us go to the center of the tent, for we will watch no longer today. Once they knew they might leave their places, the animals were less eager to do so, for they suddenly realized how disappointed they were now that they were not to see the pretty lady with the blue, blue eyes. Now began Lion, after all had been seated and doing his best to speak gaily. I suggest that we, but what it was Lion had in mind, no one ever came to know, for just at that moment he was interrupted by a pattering shower of silvery rain. The shimmery flecks fell everywhere, round the animals on their heads and on their backs. What in the world is this? exclaimed Lion. Why, they're spangles, cried Elephant, who had picked up some of the bits with the tip of his trunk. Spangles, sure enough agreed Diggledy Dan, though I never saw any as bright, nor have I ever known spangles to come out of the sky. But they can't have come from the sky, reasoned Tiger, for how could they have passed through the roof of the tent? Then, as if to prove Tiger wrong, there came a second and even greater shower than before. This time there were so many spangles that they fairly tinkled as they fell while mingling with their tinkling was a rippling laugh that sounded like silver bells played all in a row and of all marvelous things the voice came from the depths of the great red and golden home that belonged to giraffe instantly all eyes were turned toward the house on the wheels at that very same moment its doors swung apart and there framed by the opening stood the pretty lady with the blue blue eyes even as the animals stared in open-mouthed wonder their golden-haired visitor threw back her head and laughed until from her eyes came tears as glistening as the spangles that dotted the ground then she stopped quite as suddenly as she had begun and putting her left foot behind her and the tip of one finger to the tip of her chin made so graceful a curtsy that all the animals found themselves trying to do the very same thing though it must be confessed that some of them made a rather awkward job of it as for Diggledy Dan, he made the very grandest bow that any clown ever made, while, taking his cue from Dan, Lion put one paw to his heart and said in very solemn tones, Dear lady, we one and all bid you welcome, though how you got here we are at an entire loss to know. Why, answered the pretty lady as she tripped from the doorway to where Lion stood, I came in under the wall near the end. I went right past your nose, kangaroo. In fact, I think you were napping and at that you may be sure a certain animal looked very foolish then she continued i hid in giraffe's house and after you were seated began tossing spangles through the window near the top you see i always carry a bag of them that i may sprinkle the sunset whenever i pass so you do live at sunset house said diggledy dan just over the hill where the sky turns to pink the balloons and the message came in through my window last night goodness you didn't forget to bring them back did you monkey cried lion reprovingly for you might have guessed who had spoken but the lady only laughed at the question indeed i did not she replied and with that she gave three quick claps with her hands while from somewhere in galloped the white white horse and there clasped to a buckle of his snowy trappings were the balloons that had gone over the hill soon they were taken to where monkey had found them but alas the next moment the lady had leaped to her place and was gone down the tent like a shot no no cried all the animals please please don't go away oh please don't wailed monkey i didn't mean to be rude when i asked about the balloons i'm not going away the lady laughed back i'm just combing my hair and the mane and the tail of my white white horse and around the great circle the two of them sped then stopped in front of the animals again you see said the lady as she tossed back her curls combs and brushes are so much bother that we never carry them 
but just let the rush of the wind take their place but now that is done pray tell me why you sent for me and what i'm to do tell us a story cried ostrich about two bow tans suggested little black bear yes yes chimed all the rest about two bow tan very well nodded the lady and leaning forward on the back of the white white horse with her chin cupped in one hand she began many years ago so very many that there are not enough stripes on zebra's sides nor yet on his ears to count them there lived in faraway jungle land a very wise monkey named vargu in those days the different animals mingled not at all each being content to keep solely to the company of his very own kind now one day this monkey named vargu was seated in the fork of a tree quite lost in deep thought when a leopard trotted by underneath spying the leopard pretty lady pretty lady diggledy dan interrupted dan cried lion but the watch the pedal watch it's closing answered the clown in despair goodness so it is echoed the lady but you shall not miss the story for i will come again on the morrow with the twilight i'll come and till then fare you well and with that she was gone like a flash to the dusk while the animals all hurried back to their places each wondering what it was they were to hear the next day of the very wise monkey named varguru end of chapter seven chapter eight of the adventures of diggledy dan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the adventures of diggledy dan by edwin p norwood chapter eight in which the pretty lady continues her story hidden away in the folds of that mantle called twilight which as every one knows is laid over the earth with every setting of the sun is a wee little hour that is fairly made for the telling of stories and to those of spangleland who know how to find it though none save they who possess the pedal watch will ever learn how there is a very minute which marks the beginning of half-past twilight and that is the best time of all with its coming the blue of the tent-pole seems to grow a shade softer and the great rope-fretted roof and the lazy breeze-wafted walls melt from white into gray it is then that the red and gold cages slyly gleam from their places in the circle they form and most wonderful of all then that every door opens thanks to good tubo tan and on this particular evening of which you are to hear you may be sure that the funny old clown in the polka dot suit that's diggledy dan and the chattering brown fellow with the twinkling brown eyes monkey of course had loosed all the animals much faster than ever before the reason you've guessed it the promised story from the pretty lady with the blue blue eyes hardly had the animals taken their places when there came the sound of hoofbeats mingling with the laugh that was so like to tinkle bells and into the circle galloped the white white horse bearing the one for whom they all waited a merry twilight she cried as the two came to a stop in front of the group a merry twilight to you answered lion and then all the rest added their voices in greeting while dan skipping to the side of the white white horse offered his round pointed hat as a cup to receive the pretty lady's foot that he might assist her to alight this she accepted as quick as a wink and tossing her slim little whip and the bag with the spangles to the broad back of hippo made a quick little run and a quick little bound twitched her toe-tips together just as riders always do at the circus and then ran straight to the seat in the midst of the animals now said she if you will pay the strictest attention i'll go on with the story but first who will tell me just how it began at this all the animals talked at one time and there arose such a din that the pretty lady put her two hands to her ears in direst despair order order shouted lion gracious what a racket giraffe since you were the only one who remained silent you may tell us the first part of the tale so giraffe took the chalk and going to the side of his house wrote these words many years ago that time animals mixed with own folks only wise monkey vargu by name thinking in tree leopard passes underneath signed giraffe 
exactly cried the lady you see the very wise monkey named Vargu had been sitting there wondering why it was that the different kinds of animals could not be more sociable so when the leopard came in sight what do you suppose Vargu did a most unheard of and a most daring thing he spoke to him now at first the leopard whose name was softfoot could not believe his ears so he kept straight on his way but Vargu was determined he spoke once again and with that the leopard stopped full in his tracks and gazed at the monkey in utter amazement why what does this mean he called up to the other you cannot speak to me you are a monkey ah answered Vargu, but i can speak to you even if i am a monkey and if you don't believe it just listen to this hello mr leopard hello 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 and with that he went scampering to the very top of the tree for a moment softfoot made as if to spring into the tree but he finally contented himself with blinking his eyes in a dazed sort of way and then making off through the maze of the grass shaking his head as he went yet try as he would he could not forget what had happened he thought of it as he was going to sleep and he thought of it when he wakened then curiosity got the better of him and the next afternoon found him trotting along beneath the very same tree and there as before sat the monkey called Fargu. hi there mr leopard glad to see you again shouted the monkey from his place up above better stop and visit a while i know a mighty fine story i don't want to hear it snarled softfoot besides as i warned you yesterday leopards and monkeys can't speak to one another leopards talk to leopards and that's enough and away he went through the grass now that very same night when all the leopards were gathered together great spot biggest of them all began to tell one of his stories some of the baby leopards were interested but as for softfoot he had heard the tale so many times that he knew it by heart so putting his nose between his paws he lay with his thoughts far away he was thinking of the monkey who lived in the tree he wanted to tell me a story mused softfoot i wonder what it was about and so though leopards never never had anything to do with any animals except their very own kind it somehow happened that the following evening found softfoot trotting along under the same tree again there sat the monkey but to softfoot's surprise he spoke not a word so the leopard moved on to the deep grass beyond but after a moment he walked back again and still the monkey uttered never a sound for a third time he passed and then softfoot could stand the silence no longer well he blurted aren't you going to say anything now at this precise moment the monkey called Vargu did a far more daring thing than he had done when he first spoke to softfoot he made a great swing from the branch where he sat and landed plump under his visitor's nose with a start of surprise the leopard crouched back and for a moment he made as if he were going to leap off through the grass had he done so i'm sure i don't know what might have come of this tale indeed i'm afraid there might have been none to tell for who knows but what failing at this very time Fargu might never have accomplished his plan but without so much as moving one inch from the point he had reached on the ground when he swung he calmly sat down and began to count on his toes one two three four five six seven <sighs> long breath eight nine ten dear me i wonder if i'm going to have enough exclaimed he to himself just as if there wasn't another animal for miles and miles around then he picked up his left foot and began to use its toes for counters all over again by this time softfoot had quite swallowed his snarl and if he had been a house cat instead of a leopard there is no telling what might have happened to him for he was simply overcome with curiosity eleven twelve thirteen fourteen continued Vargu for goodness sake fourteen what broke in softfoot why answered Fargu, looking up stories of course fifteen sixteen 
Do you mean to say you know that many stories? demanded the leopard again, interrupting. Of course I do, replied the other. But since leopards can't talk to monkeys, you wouldn't be interested. 1920. But I am interested, protested Softfoot. Of course you are, said Farku as he dropped his foot and ceased counting. And I know that you know a whole lot of tales in which I would be interested. More than that, we both know that all the different kinds of animals know stories that they might tell one another if they only would and be a lot happier and a lot more sociable as a result. So why in the world don't we all get acquainted and be friends? We just can't, answered Softfoot. It isn't done. But we two are doing it, aren't we? Yes, admitted the other slowly. Well, argued Fargu, what we two can do, all the animals can do, if they only will. And I have a plan that I am sure will succeed. What do you say? Will you help me? The leopard sat thinking for fully a minute. Then he walked up and down several times beneath the tree. Aw, oh, come on, coaxed Barku. There's my paw on it, monkey, the other said finally. My name's Thoughtfoot. Mine's Vargu, the monkey answered gleefully. V-A-R-G-U, with the U silent, please. And now, suppose we climb into the tree so we can talk undisturbed. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Adventures of Diggle Dee Dan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Diggle Dee Dan by Edwin P. Norwood. Chapter 9 In Which the Pretty Lady Concludes Her Story. Once seated above, each told the other his favorite story. And these being finished, the leopard asked to hear of Vargu's secret plan. You shall have it at once, the other declared. And with that, he sounded a soft signaling note, while from somewhere appeared a solemn-eyed monkey who was almost the image of Vargu. This, said the latter, is my son, Tu Bo Tan. Pleased to meet you, said Softfoot admiringly. A mighty fine lad, sure enough. Yes, agreed Vargu. With some pride in his tone, and even though I say it who shouldn't, the very nimblest monkey in all jungle land. Indeed, that is why I have made Tubo a part of the plan. So now, if you'll both draw as close as ever you can, I'll tell you what we're to do. Just what was said, I'm sure I don't know, but there was no end of whispering, all of which argued that some deep, dark plan was afoot that doubtless would be made known in good time. Now on the following night, the pretty lady continued, a very odd thing came to pass, for from the tops of the trees in many parts of jungle land sounded a weird, mournful voice crying these words, Great rock near the desert's edge, great rock near the desert's edge, rock, rock, rock. All the animals heard the strange cry, and some sprang into the trees to learn who had made it. But by the time they had done so, the voice was far, far away, repeating the words like an echo. On the very next night, and at the very same hour, the cry came again. With the speed of the wind, it passed through the trees, wailing. Great rock near the desert's edge. Watch the hole in its face. Hole in its face. 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 Following the second message, there was no other topic in all jungle land. The different families discussed it for hours, but not even the wisdom of Black Mane, the mightiest of all the lions, could solve the riddle. Of course all knew of the rock, a huge wall of stone with a face as smooth as our own hippo's back. Some sent scouts to examine it. All returned with the very same word. There was not a sign of a hole to be found. Now on the third night, the mysterious voice came again. It was here, there, everywhere at once, so it seemed. And as it pressed on its way, these words were framed by its cry, Rock near the desert's edge. Watch the hole in its face at midnight tonight. At midnight tonight. Tonight, tonight, tonight. Excitement was everywhere. Jungle land resounded with the cries of animal chiefs, calling their followers about them. And forming into bands, each separate group began moving toward the great rock. 
Out of the forests and from the waste places they came, in herds, in troops, and in pairs. But each kind kept to itself, and, reaching the ground that stretched from the foot of the cliff, remained as far apart from the others as the width of the plain would allow. The moon was on high, and there were millions of stars. Yet though these lighted the side of the rock, there was not a trace of a hole to be seen. Still, it was not yet midnight, so with eyes fixed on the cliff, the strange gathering awaited some sign. And on the very minute it came. Yes, something was about to take place. First, every ear heard a deep, muffled sound, like a drum that is played far away. Next, a wee stream of sand began to trickle down the face of the rock, then a rattling of pebbles and still larger stones, while high up, near the top of the cliff, there gradually appeared an opening, as round and as big as elephant's foot. Not an animal dared breathe. Every eye was alert. Every muscle grew tense. Then from the very heart of the rock and out through the hole came a voice that was almost like thunder. Who wants to hear a story? It roared. But not one of the watchers made answer. Who wants to hear a story? Roared the voice once again. Then great spot, the leopard took heart. We do, he cried. We also called Black Mane, while soon from all sides came voices crying the same. Then hearken one and all, roared the voice from the rock. Now what the story was about need not concern us just now, continued the lady. But there was a story, and oh, such an interesting one. At times the listeners nudged one another with delight, while the younger animals found themselves exchanging knowing glances with those they had never so much as noticed before. But this is often the contrary way of those who tell tales. The voice that told this one suddenly stopped at the most exciting point in the story. Tell us the rest, rose the cry from the plain. Tomorrow at midnight, roared the face of the cliff. Come then, if you'd hear the end of the tale. Now you may be sure that the following night found all at the foot of the great rock again. They were gathered together a full hour before midnight and some spent the time retelling the story, but not all told it alike, and soon, of all unheard of things, animals who had never spoken to one another in all their days found themselves appealing to know if this or that were not the way the tale had been told. Even as they debated, there came a roar from the cliff, and the unseen one went on with the story. In time it was finished, and the great voice was stilled. Tell us another! cried all the animals from their place on the plain. But plead as they would, the voice came no more, and strangely enough, they never heard it again. They returned to the plain the very next night, but the hole in the great rock had been closed. They waited until long after midnight, but not one single sound came to greet them. Never had there been such a mystery, and it was talked of for hours upon hours and days upon days. Time after time, the animals came to the great rock and always in quest of the voice that was stilled. As they lingered night after night in the hope that it might come again, the various animals told their own favorite stories. And then, little by little, the different ones began listening to those that yet others told. This made for friendships, and one memorable night, a certain monkey made bold to suggest that at least once every week some particular animal be selected to tell one story to all. The thought was approved, and so, as time passed along, this trysting place came to be known by a name that is loved by every animal in jungle land. And what do you suppose it is called? The Storytime Rock, spoke up Lion. Why, yes, answered the pretty lady. But how did you know, Lion? I've heard my grandfather tell of it, but he always finished by saying there were none who ever solved the mystery of the voice that was stilled. No, no one ever did, said the lady. Yet like so many things that are thought to be mysteries, it was really simple enough. Then for goodness sake, tell us the secret, cried Monkey, for I'm just bursting to know. Why, it was like this. Long before Vargu, the watch, the watch, the pedal watch, broke in diggledy down. A thousand pardons, pretty lady, but it's almost closed. So it is, cried she, jumping to her feet. We've not a moment to lose. Back to your places, every one of you, she added as she bounded to her seat on the white, white horse. 
until half after twilight tomorrow, when I'll come to tell you the rest. And with a hurried sleep tight and a last silvery laugh, she sped away to her home in the west. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Adventures of Dealy Dan this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sahil Dalal from India. The Adventures of Diggly Dan by Edwin P. Norwood. Chapter 10 In which the pretty lady tells of mysteries and spangles. Well, said Tiger, as he folded his paws in a most complacent manner, I'm ready. We also, declared Elephant, speaking for his entire family, who, having formed a line, were just at the, that moment swaying backward and forward quite as if they were about to glide into the graceful maze of a waltz. So are all of us, commented Lion, as he surveyed the great group from his station before it. I wonder what can be keeping the pretty lady. Perhaps the white, white horse is delayed by the clouds suggested Elephant, as he paused long enough to push back the wall near the caves of the tent and peer into the dusk. I can make the out whole, whole crowds of them along the streets of the sky. They have been there all afternoon. It's always that way on market days. Even the sun can scarcely find its way. How long do you suppose it has been since half past twilight began? asked Emu of Diggledy Dan. Well, well, said the clown, as he drew the petal watch from the innermost depths of his round funny hat. Now that's what I call a question. Let me see, mused he, set setting his head on one side, pursing his very red lips, and half shutting his two twinkling eyes. I should say, though, mind you, I would not pretend to be exactly correct, I should say it has been not less than five hippo yawns, nor yet more than two cat naps. Oh, surely it must be longer than that, protested Monkey. It seems an age to me. I never saw such a watch anyway. Now, if it had behaved for but a minute more than uh, last evening, we should, have, we should all have known the secret of the story Time Rock. Monkey, monkey, sighed Lion. I am afraid that you are of that queer set of folks who are ever looking for a clock that will travel both ways at, at one time. Both ways at one time, exclaimed Monkey. Why, who ever spoke of any such thing? I surely did not. For, of course, no such clock could possibly be. No, it could not, answered Lion. Yet, I repeat, that is what you would like. For in one breath, you find fault with the petal watch because it moved too swiftly last night. And in the next, you complain because it travels too, so slowly today. Exactly, chimed Dan. Well, I never stop to think of it in just that way, admitted Monkey, as he scratched his head. And besides, besides, broke in the keen-eared hyena. Here comes the one for whom we're all waiting. Sure enough, there resounded the patter of oncoming hoofs, and the next moment, into the Menagri tent, galloped the white, white horse, carrying the pretty lady with the blue, blue eyes. Her pink, cheek, pink cheeks made the pinker by the speed of the ride, and her curls blown straight back with the rush of the wind, she drew up in the front of the group. It was the clouds, she explained. There was simply no end of them out stopping, shopping today. And then any number waited to see the sun go down. Of course, all had ha to have spangles. And some of the baby clouds wanted two helpings. That all took time. But here I am at last. See, the spangle back is almost as flat as the elephant e elephant's ear. Where will you get enough spangles to fill it again? Asked Camel. I'll be glad to tell you, but for the present, one thing at a time. Remember, we have not yet solved the mystery of the story time rock, unless she hastened to add. 
unless you have guessed the riddle of the voice that was stilled. Not one of us has, answered Lion, though we are all convinced that Vargu was pretty much at the bottom of the whole strange affair. He was, sure enough, assented the lady, and this was the way of it. Quite some time before, he had made friends with Softfoot Vargu, had discovered an all but hidden cave with an entrance from the top of the cliff, he had explored it with it repeatedly, and so knew its outer wall was almost worn through the face of the rock. Now, as you may have guessed, it was the nimble Tubu Tan who had passed through the tops of the trees, s sending out the strange cry that called all the animals together. Meanwhile, Vargu had taught Softfoot a wonderful story. Finally, there came the night when all the animals were gathered at the foot of the cliff. And then, taking a stone, Vargu pounded, pounded a hole through the wall of the cave to the other side of the rock. Next, Softfoot spoke to those on the great plain below, and then he told them the story. Of course, since he was telling it from the hollow depths of the cave, his voice sounded ever so big. And so there was really no mystery at all. Having gained his point, and that of bringing all the animals together, Vargu gave his time to the, the meetings that were held on the plain. As the years passed, Tubu Tan succeeded his father and became the favorite among all those who had told tales uh, uh, at the story time rock. And finally, he came to be a leader among them, and is th this very day. Shall we ever see him? asked Diggledy Dan. I'm sure I don't know. Sometime, perhaps. And now, one and all, a merry good night, for I must hurry away, thread my spangle needles, and set them in place. Spangle needles? repeated Puma. Pray, what are they? Why, what else but needles that catch the spangles? laughed the pretty lady, which reminds me that I was to tell you about them. Here, Diggledy Dan, take your place at, as the head of my white, white horse, while I explain just how spangles are made. You see, she went on, uh, as Dan skipped to obey, spangles are really nothing more than dewdrops squeezed out very flat. As for a supply, there is no end, but to catch them is a trick requiring no little knack. Now it has been my happy task to gather spangles for the clouds and for all the glittering hosts of our own spangle land for ever and ever so long. And this is the best way of all. First, I take a great armful of needles, medium-sized moon beams give the finest results, and thread them with cobwebs, Next, I plant them along the sides of my house directly under the edge of the eaves with their heads in the ground and their sharp little noses straight up in the air. Now, during the night, the dewdrops come to play on the roof and many jump off to the garden below. And as they do, they land on the points of the moonbeams. Now, down they come, never minding in the least, for if there is one thing that a dewdrop would rather be than a dewdrop, it's a spangle. On and on they come, piling one on the other, becoming very flat, very shiny, and very round, and then sliding onto the threads. So when warning comes, I take the spangle bag, slip, slip the knots, and let the spangle stumble and tinkle into its depths. And so I always have enough to sprinkle the sunset wherever I pass. Why, that must be the way it the rain gets into the clouds, cried Diggledy Dan. It's one of the ways, smiled the lady. And the reason why spangles always have a wee hole in the middle, remarked Seal. How wonderfully fortunate, added Zebra. Otherwise they couldn't be sued. I don't see why you say that, said Kangaroo. Say what? Why, that they have to have holes to be sewed. But they do. Can't see it, persisted Kangaroo. Why, how could one make them stay on? Just sew them, of course, answered Kangaroo. Toss them on. Now, don't be silly, Kangaroo, said Zebra. You... Hold on a moment, interrupted Lion. I think I see the point. Let me ask you, Kangaroo. On what are you thinking of sewing the spangles? 
Why, I mean, like when the pretty lady shows them on the cloud banks when she rides past, replied Kangaroo. And you, Zebra? asked Lion. Camel's plush robe and costumes and things, said Zebra. Oh, you mean S-E-W-E-D, cried Kangaroo. Oh, you mean S-O-W-E-D, apologized, apologized Zebra. And amid the laughter that followed, Dan assisted the pretty lady to the back of the white, white horse. You'll come again someday, asked Lion, as the golden-haired one waved them a smiling farewell. Someday, she replied, and giving full rein to her steed, she galloped down the length of the net. As the white, white horse nosed his way to the wall, the animals caught a glimpse of the first dartling beams of a far, dis far distant star. The pretty lady seemed to regard the beams for a moment, as if trying to make up her mind whether they would be we would quite do for spangle needles. Then the wall closed again, and the lady, the white white horse, and the star passed from view, while all of, all of the animals hurried back to their places, still discussing the spangles that were made from the dew. End of chapter 10. Recording by Sahil Dalal from India. Chapter 11 of The Adventures of Diggledy Dan this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. The Adventures of Diggledy Dan by Edwin P. Norwood. Chapter 11. In which the animals play at circus and Dan promises a story. It was but a few evenings following that upon which the pretty lady had set out in quest of the spangle needles. Diggledy Dan had mounted to his place on Hippo's broad back, and Lion had taken his in front of the group, when the clattering crew made a startling discovery. Monkey was missing! Look where they would, he was nowhere to be found. Call as they would, he gave no answering sound. He unhooked my chain, said Elephant. And opened the gate to my corral, added Ostrich. I saw him talking with Zebra not a minute ago, puzzled Dan. Zebra, repeated Lion. Zebra? Where is Zebra? Why, he's gone too. Here was a mystery indeed. Scatter at once, ordered the lion, and leave no nook unsearched. And scatter they did. Some went into the depths of the cages. Others looked underneath, while Giraffe and his family inspected every square inch of the roofs but not a glimpse did they catch of the runaway pair. Redouble the search, commanded Lion, from his station at the center of the menagerie tent. But scarcely had he spoken, when, from a distance, came the patter and clatter of hurrying hoofs. All searchers to the front countercommanded Lion, for if I mistake not the sound, here comes a visitor who will doubtless be willing to lend us her aid. Even as he concluded, there dashed into view, whom do you suppose, the pretty lady and the white, white horse. Ah, but you are wrong, for it was none other than Zebra, with that mischievous monkey perched on his back. Down the length of the tent, the two of them scurried, traveling lickety-split. Here, here, commanded Lion. Get back to your places this very minute. Just as soon as we let the wind comb our hair came the cry in reply, and the next moment, with zebra's ears flopping this way and that, 
and monkey doing his best to look entirely at ease the truants returned to the group what a picture they made zebra wore a bridle with a brilliant red plume while monkey was lost almost wholly to view in a gorgeous pink hat and a skirt made of blue well young sirs what does this mean demanded lion why whimpered monkey zebra and i talked it over and thought it would be fun to play circus so we stole away to the little tents and borrowed some costumes now don't scold lion we didn't mean to do anything wrong hmm answered lion who was really rather pleased with the thought play circus huh well go ahead let us see what you two can do oh returned monkey brightening up but we can't perform without a ring and a ringmaster and everything like that and of course we must have music added zebra you see we thought that since elephant and seal and their folks are such splendid musicians perhaps they delighted i'm sure agreed elephant amid his family's ponderous nods of approval at your service always chimed seal as his household clapped their funny front fins in consent if no objection we'll make ring scrawled giraffe on the side of a cage of course there was none so digging the top from dan's pocket and using his hind feet as a pivot giraffe spread his front legs wide apart reaching far out with his neck and gradually swung around in a great circle while he described an almost perfect ring on the ground by using the spike in the top for a marker meanwhile many willing workers rolled a dozen or more gaily painted tubs to the edge of the ring then came the band bringing all manner of drums and queer-looking horns to say nothing of elephant carrying his mammoth bass viol after which each player took a seat on one of the tubs and began to tune up for the circus of course we must have an announcer said lion i'll be him cried tiger needless to say diggledy dan was the clown while lion wearing an old silk hat that seal sometimes juggled in the real circus and armed with a whip that puma had brought from the great tent beyond playing rigmaster and so this strangest of all circuses began just watch my two ears for the tempo and time said elephant who conducted the band thus with the bow of his great fiddle held firmly in his forefoot and playing notes that fairly boomed with their bigness he set his ears to beating one two three one two three while the music tripped forth in a soft swaying waltz after a few bars had been played tiger raised his paw for silence and then stepped gravely to the front of the ring ladies and gentlemen said he i take pleasure in announcing mademoiselle monkeyetta direct from the deepest depths of jungle plant who with her marvelous steed zebra L, will now astonish you with her wonderful feats of riding at this seal and his family playing a ringing lingering ta 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 on their horns the band struck up the liveliest of melodies while into the ring trapped zebra with monkey posed on his back close behind came diggledy dan 
balancing his round pointed hat on the tip of his nose and then at a whip crack from the lion the riding began around and around went the galloping pair a maze of black and white stripes surmounted by a higgledy piggledy ball of ruffles of blue a flopping pink hat with here and there a brown leg or an arm at first monkey did little more than hold fast to zebra's short mane but gradually becoming used to his steed's measured stride the merry-eyed fellow dared to stand on his feet and to dance as they flew around the ring at this all the animals applauded with glee while lion cracked his long whip even more than before faster and faster went elephant's ears faster and faster went the music and faster and faster sped zebra and then all of a sudden this wonderful steed stopped short in his tracks sending monkey high over his head all leaped to their feet to see the marvelous rider sitting quite in a heap and striving to free his face from the depths of his hat which had been completely switched about by the tumble i say there that wasn't one of the things we planned to do uttered monkey from inside the bonnet i know it admitted zebra as he did his best to smother his laughter but as i was going round and round it occurred to me that i would make a far better looking trick mule than a handsome circus horse and as trick mules always toss their riders over their ears why i just came to a stop and there you are yes assented monkey rather ruefully here i am but scrambling to his feet and disposing of the bonnet he caught the twinkle in every eye and then he too burst into a merry laugh zebra you were quite right he said perhaps we were both taking ourselves a bit too seriously for i'm bound to confess i hardly look like one of the beautiful circus ladies who ride round the rings anyway it all added to the fun said diggledy dan in fact zebra reminded me of a donkey i once rode in a small one ring circus of the long long ago oh then you were not always with the very biggest kind questioned puma by no means answered dan and indeed might never have been had i not met gray ears the elephant a story a story cried leopard tell us the story tomorrow i will agreed diggledy dan for the petal watch warns me there is no time to-day come now zebra hurry away with the plume and costume and put them where they belong while monkey and i close each door and corral at twilight to-morrow the clown called again as zebra returned and his chain was hooked fast then i'll tell you the tale of a midsummer's day away back in the dim distant past and of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the adventures of diggledy dan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california the adventures of diggledy dan by edwin p norwood 
Chapter 12, in which Dan answers the beckoning trees. Not in all Spangle land, nor for that matter anywhere else, is there to be found quite such a twilight as that which is spun in the great tent that belongs to the monkeys and lions and tigers and things. As you must often have noted, there is among the breezes a certain one that is extremely partial to animals. It is never happier than when ruffling the forelock of some big dapple gray, teasing the tail of proud Chanticleer or cradling a gull in its wide-spreading arms. Indeed, it is the very vagrant breeze of which doubtless you have heard many times, but Wherever its fancy may carry it throughout the hours of the day, it always reaches Spangle Land just before the sun dips from view. There it seeks out a hiding place on the edge of town to watch and to wait, and at the first sign of eventide this knowing breeze slips along near the ground wriggles under the wall and so comes inside the menagerie tent once within it frolics this way and that but so very slyly that even the keenest eared of the animals can no more detect it than one might hear a butterfly sing yet it is here there and everywhere rubbing its nose against the blue of the poles and its back and its sides against the cages of red in doing this it takes just a bit of the color of both and so clothes itself in a soft purple coat then when it departs it leaves the filmy garment behind and that you see is the twilight now it was just at the moment when this vagrant breeze had cast off its robe that dan wound his arms around his knees gazed thoughtfully across the tops of them and started the story of gray ears the elephant it all began with the beckoning trees he said rather slowly you see they kept calling me i was never far from them the one ring circus of which i was a part was so very small that it never ventured into the cities but contented itself with visiting the smallest of hamlets and villages so as we moved from one to the other our winding wagon train threaded roads that led through the woods when we pitched our tent it was often at the very edge of the trees and always ever and always they beckoned me at times it was as if their topmost branches were swayed by great puffs of wind at such moments they would bend toward me and then toss themselves back again as if saying in pantomime come on dan dan diggledy dan come on and play and as often as they called just that often did i resolve to answer but somehow i seemed never able to find the time you see just because it was so very small the circus needed the help of all of us to put it in place to give the performances and then to move on and on and so i was busy throughout all the day as the summer advanced and the woods grew more green and the shadows more dense the call came again and again there were times when i was tempted to let everything go 
and just skip away to the deep leafy depths now this may seem odd to you ah but it does not spoke up leopard i know the feeling and i added tiger so do we all said lion a bit wistfully indeed if it were not for the certain most important reason i sometimes think we animals might well there is no telling what we might do but of course there are the children yes yes the children repeated all the animals very softly the children to be sure agreed niggledy dan i thought of them too it is all very well for you to dream of running off to the woods dan dan diggledy dan i would say to myself but what of the children that come to the circus to see the clowns what yes what would they say if there wasn't any clown answer me that diggledy dan and yet there came a day when all my reasoning went to the winds it happened on an afternoon when our tent was pitched between the littlest of towns and the greatest of woods the crowd had come the band had begun to play the circus was in full swing i was in the ring jesting with the ringmaster and cutting my cleverest capers but my thoughts were in the depths of the woods for i could see the green of the trees through the eaves of the tent and the rugged brown trumps through the half-curtained door and oh how they called me not even the mirth of the tow-headed boy who sat in the very front row nor the forget-me-nots on the bonnet of the little girl just behind him could take the tug from my heart now on this day as always there came the moment when i made a face at the ringmaster while he on his part let fly with his whip and as was the fashion i pretended great awe of him and dashed from the ring to escape his advance this bit of acting i had done whole dozens of times always scampering as far as the door at the rear of the tent and then coming back to my place but just as i reached the curtain on this afternoon the great wind puffs began how the hundreds upon hundreds of branches bent forward and how they swept backward again they were beckoning me onward beckoning as never before and so without so much as turning my head i bonded on through the door and ran straight for the trees as i reached the first of them there came the voice of the ringmaster bidding me return soon other voices voices great and small and deep and shrill rose in one clear cry come back dan come back diggledy dan but the woods now held me fast in their arms on on diggledy dan called every leaf stop stop pleaded every child and mingling with their voices i could hear the guttural bass of the ringmaster's shout how i ran deep deep into the depths of the boundless woods i sped and deep deep into the boundless woods came they who gave chase peering back over my shoulder i could see all the children and all their fathers and mothers and uncles and even their aunts coming
pell-mell in pursuit all led by the ringmaster in his shiny top hat and shiny top boots you must not run away dan warned a voice from within come away come away dan sang the leaves from the trees and so i pressed on indeed i could not stop the leaves underfoot seemed in league with those overhead they pushed against the soles of my feet sending me forward by leaps and by bounds but fast as i ran those who came after proved even swifter than i looking back once again i could see the reed-master had redoubled his speed on he came the split tails of his coat sticking straight out behind while clinging tight to the ends of them were the tow-headed boy and the little girl with the forget-me-not bonnet i was glad they were gaining on me and yet i was sorry i wanted them to catch me and yet i did not meanwhile i ran like the wind but they came nearer and nearer now the ringmaster was so close that i could make out the tiger-eyed buttons on his very red vest a hundred paces ahead showed the shadowy outline of a densely leaved thicket for this cover i sped and rounded its shoulder shut my pursers from view and then just as i did so something came from out of the air swept me square off my toes swung me outward and aloft and then dropped me into the depths of the thicket as i scrambled to my feet i could hear the clamoring cries and glimpse the hurrying forms of the throng as they swept around the corner of the coppice that covered me there were children of all ages and sizes and many curls and many hair ribbons held out on the lap of the wind and there was no end of mothers with very bright eyes and very pink cheeks hand in hand with no end of fathers and some carried umbrellas which they brandished overhead as they ran but suddenly there came a halt for a puzzled half minute the ringmaster stood looking first to the left and next to the right then as if making up his mind that i had gone toward the north he cut the air with his whip thrust it forward like a captain leading his troops on to victory and cried into the deeper woods instantly all the fathers pointed aloft in exactly the same manner and away went the throng raising more of a cry than before at this i would have recalled them but no sooner had i opened my mouth to do so then there came a warning shh so tremendous that it fairly blew the hat off my head and looking to the left and to the right i saw that i was standing between two great mud-colored posts roofed in with a chin and the undermost side of a monstrous mouth overhung with a nose that came halfway to the ground not a word out of you warned the mouth swish swish from side to side went the nose tighter and tighter squeezed the two ponderous posts and meanwhile 
the voices of those who had left me behind grew fainter and fainter and fainter until finally i could hear them no more now then said the mouth as the posts which were really two legs drew apart and the nose more correctly a trunk reached back and lifted me to a place in the light now you may make as much noise as you please and looking up i found myself gazing into the good-humoured face of an elephant of marvellous size end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the adventures of diggledy dan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lily the adventures of diggledy dan by edwin p norwood chapter thirteen in which dan learns of peanuts and things at first my captor merely appealed to me as the merriest eyed elephant i had ever seen and surely the largest but i soon discovered that he had a way of going about matters in a most business-like manner thus he immediately began to plan for the two of us now then said he we will leave this rather public place and go to my private apartment so if you will just hop to the top of my third toe yes the right foot will do and place your arm about my knee ah that is the way we will proceed and so i clinging tightly to the big fellow's leg a great deal as children sometimes do when they are very small and father's foot is to be persuaded to give them a ride we started on our way the whole of me moving quite like a walking stick when it accompanies its master on a leisurely stroll through the park on through thicket grove and tangled foliage we went and then quite of a moment passed between two giant trees which formed the natural doorway leading into a half enclosed room of the woods i call it a room because it possessed the entrance just mentioned a floor entirely free from undergrowth a raggedy west window outlined with bows in a wide spreading roof fashioned by a gigantic vine two logs with branches broken off near the trunks a flat-topped stump of considerable size and a curious hanging basket affair formed by a lacing of vine loops completed the furnishings on the floor was a pile of freshly plucked leaves you will really have to forgive the appearance of things apologized my host you see i was at lunch when i heard the shouts and so jumped right up from the table and made my way to the thicket besides i moved in only last night nothing fancy i'll admit but comfortable i was rather taken with the rustic furniture so in keeping with a place of this kind don't you think but do sit down and motioning me to accept one of the logs while he took the other the big fellow swung one foot into the basket-like contrivance of which i have spoken leaned back in an attitude of perfect contentment and rumbled something about his idea of solid comfort then noting that my eye was upon the queer-looking swing that supported his foot he added ah i see you are interested in this little invention of mine a combination hammock and provider if you please hammock for the reason you already see provider because and at that he set the foot that lay in the loops of the vine to pumping so hard that the whole of the roof began to rock as if shaken by some mighty wind scores upon scores of leaves soon carpeted the floor these the ponderous fellow swept together with the tip of his trunk without so much as leaving his seat and then added them to the half-eaten pile i had noticed a rather clever idea i should say said he with some show of pride that is if one doesn't mind eating the shingles off one's own house of course you see the point roof shingles leaves ha ha i thought you would and with that he laughed as though he had made quite the best joke in all the world but in another moment he had dropped into silence only to break it again to inquire my name diggledy dan i replied and yours gray ears the elephant he answered as his look suddenly changed to one of great soberness not just great ears mind you nor yet merely elephant but great ears the elephant in fact 
It is what one might call a whole sentence of a name. However, aside from the fact that it does not well lend itself to being nicknamed, I cannot say much for it. For, in the first place, just as there are two sides to every story, so are there to every ear. And the underside of an elephant's ear is oft-times a rare pink, and frequently as speckled as the nether part of a trout. As for the phrase, the elephant, it is absolutely and positively silly. For, to look at me, you would not suppose me a bumblebee, nor yet a bobolink, now would you? Still, such is my name, and I make the most of it. But to change the tune of our talk, tell me, whence have you come, and why did you run away from the circus? Answering, I told him my story, and ended by adding that had he not prevented, I should have shouted most lustily, and so called back those who doubtless were still in pursuit of me. For, said I, it was quite wrong of me to have run away in the first place. Yes, in a way, assented Great Ears, but on the other hand, I am sure the children, the grown-ups, and even the ringmaster will enjoy their lark in the woods, even though they return without you. Thus, no inconvenience has come to them. You will go back to your place in the late evening, and, in the meantime, perform a most charitable act by lending me your merry company for a few hours. For, to be perfectly frank, I, too, am a runaway, and a rather lonesome one. You don't mean that you are... I began with some excitement. A circus elephant, finished Great Ears, none other than the mightiest and most marvelous of all pachyderms, and easily the leading feature of the mammoth menagerie, of the very biggest circus. And he voiced these my long words with so much impressiveness that had he worn a waistcoat, I am sure he would have thrust his thumb toes into the armholes of it. Here was an adventure. A meeting with one who came from the great, great circus, of which I, who had ever been with the smallest, had heard and dreamed of, yet never seen. But in the woods, you... I don't understand, I puzzled. My dear fellow, returned Great Ears, as he waved in the direction of the very tallest trees, do you suppose that you are the only one who feels the call? Besides, I had been told that a specially interesting variety of the pistache di terre was to be found in this part of the woods. So I laid my plans, and, while we were at the railroad yards last night, waiting our turn to go into our cars, I walked softly away along the shadowy places, kept to the back of the streets of the town, and so finally reached the open country. But as to the earth nut, that is, said to be found hereabouts, a whole morning search has failed to discover even a single vine. You see, he continued with a great show of vanity, I have the largest collection of the pistache di terre in existence. And spreading his toes apart two at a time and burrowing into the openings with the tip of his trunk, he began to take something from each. And then, what do you suppose he finally laid in a heap on the top of the tree stump? What? cried all the animals in excited chorus. Peanuts, answered Diggledy Dan, just ordinary, everyday circus peanuts. And after all those long words, too, at least that was what they looked like to me. And so, never thinking, I blurted, oh, peanuts, no doubt with a look of disappointment, for I had expected something quite wonderful, and then added, no, thank you, I don't believe I care for any just now, but don't let that keep you from having some. Having some! repeated my companion, as if unable to believe his ears, large as they were. Having some, he fairly shouted again in horrified tones. And then, looking at me in the most pitying manner, he added, Why, friend clown, do you not suppose there are elephants who look upon the peanut as something more than a thing to be eaten? That there are those of us who study them? For what happier hobby could a circus elephant have than that which calls for the collecting of this most excellent nut? Consider this one, for instance, continued Great Ears, as he held one of the peanuts up to the light. That is a true goober. See with what delicate sweep it curves in at the waistline? Here, on the other hand, is a quite different nut. The pindar that comes from the islands. A sailor brought it to the circus one day. To you and to him it is merely a peanut. But to the trained eye, there is a warm yellow tint in its wrinkled face, and a certain sweep to its curves that place it far from its various cousins. So, during my travels, thousands upon thousands of nuts have passed under my eyes. 
and from them I have made this collection of exactly seventeen different ones. And so he passed from one peanut to another, pointing out the beauties of each, went on Diggledy Dan, and was just explaining that the word peanut was unknown to the children of some lands, while monkey nut served for a name instead, when suddenly, stopping short and gathering his brows into three immensely deep puckers, he fixed his attention upon something away toward the west. Following his gaze, I saw a blood-red blotch that fairly flamed far off through the trees. Fire! we both cried as if in one breath and then great ears began to laugh at the thought fire nothing said he it's the sun making ready for bed goodness me so it is i exclaimed i had no idea it was so late i hope you will not think me rude but really i must go at once of course you must the big fellow agreed as he led the way from the room i fear i have delayed you too long as it is but never doubt i'll have you back at the edge of the littlest town in but a little while more than no time at all come on to my third toe hold fast there we're off and with his trunk rolled into position while i clung with both arms to his leg great ears started forward with such amazing strides that had i not been standing on one of his feet i would surely have thought that he had suddenly been shod with seven league boots away we crashed making straight for the heart of the sunset onward we hey dan dan the pedal watch the pedal watch cried monkey closing sure enough rejoined diggledy dan and a minute later he was skipping away down the menagerie tent calling a good night to his friends and assuring him that he would be back on the morrow and tell them still more of the tale end of chapter thirteen recording by lily Chapter Fourteen of the Adventures of Diggledy Dan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. The Adventures of Diggledy Dan by Edwin P. Norwood. Chapter Fourteen, in which Dan parts with old friends and prepares to claim a reward. Never, I'll warrant you, had the greatest of woods resounded with so strange a commotion. Continued Diggledy Dan, as he again took up the thread of his story. Never, I'll make bold to surmise had so singular a carryall with such a gaily dressed passenger boomed through the quiet of its sunset hour for what could have proved more of a surprise to those peaceful surroundings than the approach of an elephant most as big as a house coming onward with strides as wide as a wall and a clown clinging fast to one foot yet forward and crash and we plunged making straight for the littlest town far ahead the tree trunks and the low-hanging boughs showed blue-black against the russet and red of the sky that windowed the woods to the west and from this very spot sprang long fan-like rays with edges of silver and edges of gold travelling to meet us and bathing all that they passed in soft yellow light strange for this light straight for this light the two of us lunged smashingly dashingly onward shaking the ground and the glades as we went bound for the edge of the town now we came to the top of a leaf-covered slope that played floor to an open space lined on both sides with trees and there at the end was the fast sinking sun while smack up against its ruby red face stood the spire of a church in the town at sight of the steeple we slackened our pace, feared a bit 
to the left and in a half minute more reached the fringe of the trees for which i had sped when i first took flight to the woods another stride and gray ears had thrust his huge head through a rift in the foliage and we looked out over the field and then i made the most startling discovery the circus was nowhere to be seen thinking i might have mistaken the spot i sprang from my place to the ground but alas there were the holes that had once held the stakes and the tracks and the scars left by the red wagon wheels to prove what i feared to be only too true as i stood there sadly surveying the spot gray ears strode across to my side they have gone i said to him sadly gone on leaving diggledy dan gone to be sure he agreed but tush tush what a queer tone of voice and who ever heard of a clown with a mouth that turned down so cheer up for doubtless it is all for the best and in the meantime let us again seek the trees for i think i heard some one approaching true enough as we slipped out of sight three figures came toward us along a path that skirted the field and there walking hand in hand with a big broad-shouldered man were the tow-headed boy and the little girl with the forget-me-not bonnet of course they'll get another one won't they uncle tommy tom the little girl was asking as they came within hearing oh by all means every circus must have its clown but where from will he come well i'm not certain replied the one called uncle tommy tom but i saw the ringmaster getting a gaily colored suit from out of a big trunk just after we had returned from the chase and there was a man fussing with an odd-looking wig and mixing some red and white paint then i heard the two of them talking and the man with the paint said he'd have everything in shape by the time they reached the next town oh then of course they were getting ready to make a new clown spoke up the tow-headed boy in a most knowing and positive fashion make one questioned the little girl make one how why up to be sure answered the boy clowns are always made up though i can't tell you up where cause the piece i read didn't say and so still talking the three of them melted away in the gathering dusk even as i stood gazing down the path they had taken i felt my companion's trunk on my shoulder come come friend dan there's nothing to be gained by tarrying here besides i have already put my wits back to work and hit upon a plan by which even now you are as good as engaged in a clown with the very biggest circus no not a word was his warning command as i sought to ply him with questions for i have not yet completed the whole of my scheme besides our first thought must be of a lodging place for the night so your arms round my leg once again obeying i mounted the big fellow's foot and we plunged back into the depths of the woods presently we came to a space well covered with grass and here we made ready for bed hollowing a hole 
for the bumpy part of his head gray ears was soon stretched out on his side while i using the curve of his trunk for a pillow snugly bunked in the lee of his ponderous front knees twice i th sought to speak of the plan he had named and twice did my companion bid me be silent and so lying there gazing upward through the canopy of boughs to the patches of star-sprinkled sky i pictured the future that unfolded before me the night was balmy and there were sweet-smelling flowers near my head gray ears trunk made a most comfortable cushion and close by a cricket sang so in spite of my musings i was soon ready for sleep indeed i rather resented being suddenly roused and told to make ready for another march through the woods still i obeyed and in what seemed even less than a twinkling found myself in a tent of marvellous size in it were simply whole battalions of clowns and most wonderful of all a fireplace quite as big as the side of our own hippo's cage then from somewhere there dangled dozens upon dozens of mile-long vine branches and taking hold of the ends of them the clowns began to bind some one fast to the ground even as i looked i saw that the some one was gray ears yes the strange clowns were making a big fellow a prisoner and prying his great toes apart were extracting the peanuts one at a time as fast as the nuts were removed they were taken to the front of the fireplace in vain did their owner protest all were to be burned on the spot finally the first of the peanuts was pushed to the edge of the fire in a moment i recognized it as my friend's favorite nut the delicately colored pindar that had come from the islands and crying no no not that one i bounded straight for the hearth bent upon rolling the nut from the flames the heat was intense i could feel its hot breath on my brow then a wind seemed to fan the flames into great leaping tongues and looking about i saw that all the clowns had joined round with hand bellows which they were pumping for all they were worth at the same moment i reached forward to rescue the peanut and then i opened my eyes above me was the same canopy of boughs but through one of the chinks where there once had shone stars a great shaft from the sun poured its warm dazzling light full in my eyes next though next though not so much as a leaf was astir i felt the touch of a breeze and turning my head saw a vast moving car flopping first up and then down and under that ear was a face wearing the most mischievous smile why why it's morning i cried springing up but where is the tent and the clowns morning sure enough answered gray ears as he ponderously rose to his feet as for tents and clowns and all that sort of thing i'm sure i've seen none though i must say you were making fuss enough just before you wake up to have been playing hide and go seek with all in existence but tell me what it all was about and so 
as we busied ourselves gathering berries and green grass for breakfast i related the whole of my dream now really i questioned in ending are there that many clowns with the very biggest circus goodness no laughed gray ears still there are many two score and more alas then i sighed they will not need diggledy dan nevertheless they will keep you answered my friend as we sat down to our meal and for this reason as you of course know i am a runaway from the very biggest circus and one of its very great features now while i said nothing at the time i came upon this placard tacked to a tree while you were examining the circus grounds at the edge of town last night and with that gray ears produced a square of bright yellow cardboard with these words in tall type printed on it lost gray ears the elephant large and suitable reward if returned to the very biggest circus goodness i cried at the sight of it we must be careful else some one will capture you and take you back home before you are ready to go careful bosh retorted gray ears why beginning being careful when i am already captured already captured i exclaimed in amazement by who why said he by none other than diggledy dan but i don't understand i began you mean that you are to take me back to the very biggest circus and claim the reward the reward of being allowed to be one of its clowns so come on make haste and let us break camp for we must be ready to enter the big tent to-night and between now and then we have a long way to go End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the adventures of diggledy dan this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. The Adventures of Diggledy Dan by Edwin P. Norwood. Chapter 15 In Which Dan and Gray Ears Arrive at Their Goal some day i may relate the happenings that fell to our lot between the heart of the woods and the great river's edge continued diggledy dan but i fancy you are just now more impatient to learn exactly what came to pass when gray ears and i reached our long journey's end so suppose we all shut our eyes very tight give a marvelous jump and thus leaving the point where breakfast was had land plump on the spot from whence i got my first glimpse of the tents that were to be my new home the day was most done when forcing his way through a thicket great ears emerged on a grass-covered ridge that reclined with its head in the woods and its feet at the brim of a river the stream wound to the north and to the south while just across it and so very near the bank that one wondered the buildings did not tumble into the water lay a city and within the city close by the edge that was nearest us sprawled a great billowing something 
of dazzling white this something swayed gently in the sun lowering rays and waved to the breeze with its pennants and flags of yellow and blue yes there it lay quite as if awaiting our coming the home of the biggest circus of all and to-night when darkness has come we shall both cross the river and so reach the very rear of the tents said gray ears as his eyes followed mine over the face of a stream is it there we will cross i asked as i pointed toward a massive iron bridge what and meet no end of persons and things certainly not i have a far better way but we must bide our time and meanwhile gather a supply of long trailing vines the purpose of which you will learn later on so the last hour of the day was spent in searching the woods for vine branches being careful to select only those that were well strung with leaves by the time we had completed this task and returned to the ridge darkness had fallen and the lights been set twinkling in the city and tents that lay over the stream now all is ready said gray ears and bidding me take the mass of vines in my arms he put his trunk about my waist and lifted me not to my place on his foot but to the very tip-top of his head and as i knelt there with the vines between my knees in my hands clasping fast to the upper edge of his ears the big fellow swung straight down the slope and walked smack into the river so carefully did gray ears advance that his great feet made hardly a splash i could hear only a soft gurgling sound that came from where the current suddenly meeting the side of what it probably mistook for a queer-fashioned rock protested in some little surprise before slipping around the ends of it finally even this murmuring ceased all movement seemed stilled looking about i saw that the whole of gray ears not counting the top of his head and a part of his trunk had become submerged in the depths of the stream and so while i perched in my place quite as though i were voyaging on the back of a turtle gray ears swam on all went as it should until we reached the very middle of the river then a rowboat suddenly shot into view from the lee of the low wooded island two men were in it one at the oars and the other idly dangling a lantern from his place in the bow it was headed straight for us even as i looked the rays of his light fell full on my face i quickly crouched down but not before the man in the bow had caught sight of me a clown a clown a sure enough clown cried he to the one at the oars pull too just a bit there no i have lost him and he began to cast about with the lantern meanwhile i felt the tip of gray ears trunk pressed close to the side of my head grasping the end of it and i held it up to my ear while through it came a whisper in warning quick down on your knees with one arm thrust in the air we must escape them and their questions for we cannot afford the delay 
even as i obeyed i could feel the great trunk winding in and about me and i knew that gray ears was wrapping me round with her trailing ends of the vines meanwhile the man with the lantern was pointing it this way and that while his companion kept insisting that he had seen nothing at all but i did he protested i saw the whole of his round funny face and believe it or not he was sliding along on the top of the water at this reply the one who was rowing almost tumbled over with laughter in doing so he loosed his hold on the oars so that the boat swung about and so almost bumped into gray ears and me there goes an old log with a broken off limb all covered with vines how would it do for your clown who sits on the water jeered the doubting one and he still poking fun and the other still looking the two of them passed on while we again took to our course to finally land on the coveted shore we found ourselves standing in what seemed to be a yard of considerable size and skirted on all but the riverside by a very tall fence to the right and the left were gigantic bunkers piled high with coal between these we advanced but had gone scarcely three paces when we came face to face with a big bearded watchman who carried a glaring white light in one of his hands and a knotted black stick in the other hey there he cried you can't come in here it's against the rules but sir you must do so i pleaded we've just got to go on got to nothing reported the man there's orders rid as paint now you gwine right back into the river and he turned his light on a huge board of white on which there appeared in very black letters notice all persons are warned to keep off these premises yes i cried but that can't possibly mean us because we're not persons but just gray ears and diggledy dan not persons eh repeated the watchman he scratched his head well now i don't know about that besides rumbled gray ears you see the and he placed the nose of his trunk near the big watchman's ear and whispered something i couldn't quite hear oh came the reply oh in that case of course why in the world didn't you say so at first while to my utter surprise he hurried to the gates that led to the street unfastened the lock and threw them apart with so much of a flourish that one might have supposed us a prince with his train through the opening strode gray ears and we were once more on our way long rows of warehouses as dark and silent as the depths of the night now shut the very biggest circus from view but over the edge of their frowning black tops a warm yellow glow lighted the face of the sky and we knew that this came from the tents for which we were bound up street and down street the two of us went meeting no one at all and then all of a sudden our path was beset by a burly policeman who seemed not one whit less than a whole half mile there he stood twirling his moustache and his round polished club 
and whistling a tune from over the seas but at sight of us he shut his lips with a start brought his club to his side and raising one hand signaled an immediate halt stop he commanded you cannot come down this street but oh mr policeman we just have to i cried sorry but this is a one-way thoroughfare vehicles can't move in the direction you are going you'll have to turn back yes i argued but brave ears isn't a vehicle he's only an elephant makes no difference answered the policeman orders are orders and no exceptions made and with that he began to twirl his club once again and to parade back and forth as if to guard the whole widths of the street but you see mr bluecoat began gray ears as he finished the sentence in a whisper with his trunk against the other's right ear oh 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 exclaimed the policeman oh why go right ahead oh i'm sorry to have delayed you while he actually stood at salute as we once more moved on our way determining to ask my companion very soon what it was he had said to the watchman and to the one in buttons and blue i held fast to the big fellow's ears and peering ahead awaited a glimpse of the tents then turning a corner we came into a street and there away at the foot of it lay the goal that we sought all flooded with lights of amber and gold at sight of the tents gray ears came to a stop in the shelter of a well-shadowed wall and placing his trunk around my waist lifted me from his head to the ground here friend dan we find ourselves at our journey's end a minute more and we shall have entered the great tent and you claimed the reward of finding and returning gray ears the elephant it is then that you will take your place among the clowns and i go back to my station we have had our holiday together and a right merry one it has been who knows perhaps we shall one day repeat it again in the meantime do not be surprised if i cease speaking to you for unless i am away from the circus i rarely talk to any one indeed you might spend months upon months with the very biggest circus and yet never hear one of its animals utter so much as a word and now he added in that business-like tone which he assumed at times let us decide upon the manner in which we will enter the greatest tent first of all we will arrange the placard that i found tacked to the street and which i believe you have in the top of your hat here is a stick of charcoal which i picked up in the coal yard as we passed through the gates on the side of the car that is blank you must write in a very bold hand found by dignity dan taking the marker i did as he wished excellent approved gray ears this i will take charge of and display in proper fashion when we make our grand entrance you on your part will stand on my back now then up you go and with that i was swung into place next gray ears wrapped the long leaf-covered streamers around his neck and looped one of them well into his mouth quite 
as a horse wears a bridle and bit then he tossed me the ends which i wound around my wrists just as you have seen the driver of many horses do with the end ends of his reins next i sprang upright on gray ears broad back there i stood feet apart my head held erect leaning backward and aslant but kept well in place by the vine reins that led from my ponderous mount's mouth are you ready friend dan came the rumbling cry every bit of me i called in reply then not answering in words but with a trumpeted note of much triumph great ears moved forward while i my suit flapping in the breeze brought about by his speed lay back on the reins much as the driver of a thundering chariot rests upon his and wondered and waited and watched End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the adventures of diggledy dan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california the adventures of diggledy dan by edwin p norwood chapter sixteen in which dan joins the very biggest circus never had gray ears taken such stupendous strides said diggledy dan as he once more went on with his story so fast did he move that in less than a minute we had reached the edge of the light that spread like a fan round the tents and then we plunged into the midst of it to find ourselves in the very backyard of the circus through the maze of red wagons the two of us went past little white tents that shimmered with light and next in much slower and more methodical fashion picked our way through the groups of playful plumed ponies each decked with trappings that shone like stars past these went the both of us past these and strange men and strange women too all dressed in gay costumes of every color and hue but at the sight of the latter great ears warned me to drop down on his back and hide quickly away in the long winding vines and when i had done so without once being seen he headed straight for the rear of the greatest of tents from whence came the sound of the circus how it fell on the air and fell on the ear a mingling of music and the hum of the crowd blended with hoofbeats and laughter now not save a curtain divided us from all of it and this gray ears thrust back with a swing of his trunk and then in the space of much less than a wink what wonders came into view there were people to the left of us people to the right of us and still more across from us all terraced in masses around a tent so tremendous that at its far ends were lost in a shadowy haze there were pretty ladies to the left of us pretty ladies to the right of us and pretty ladies in front of us all mounted on horses that ran round the rings there was a ringmaster to the left of us another to the right of us and a third just before us each arrayed in the latest of fashionable dress and high up above us were splashes of red 
and dashes of blue that were reflected from the sides of the massive round holes that held the huge tent in its place there was the sheen of the sawdust and the gray of the roof and clusters of golden lights that flooded the air and flooded the ground and the clusters of silver lights over the rings at the ends that looked in the distance like bits of the moon and into the midst of this hoopla and whirl into the heart of the very biggest circus stepped gray ears with me hidden away on his back so quickly indeed had he come through the doorway that those in the rings and those in the crowd did not know of his presence until he was well into the tent and then he was discovered from all sides at once hey look at hey look at cried those to the left and those to the right well of all unheard of things the pretty ladies exclaimed as they brought their mounts to a halt now tell us at once the three ringmasters demanded each stamping his foot as if to resent it what's the meaning of this strange interruption yes do so right now every fair rider protested as she gave a toss of her head to prove that she meant it but for answer gray ears merely kept on his way down the track that circled the tent still onward he went around the most distant ring one of those with the, the cluster of silvery lights that looked like bits of the moon and trailing behind in most persistent fashion came the trio of ringmasters all talking at once and urging that gray ears be gone to his station yet never a sound did the big fellow utter until he had reached the ring in the center cling fast and be ready then came his command as the end of his trunk brushed the vines near my ear and kneeling and holding the placard on high he gravely bowed to the crowd and bowed to the riders and bowed to the ringmasters three found they all cried as they read the words i had written found by diggledy dan but who puzzled all in the very next breath is this one called diggledy dan and where may he be questioned the ringmasters three as they all cracked their whips for attention yes where is he demanded four separate voices each of the four of them supplying a word while into the ring stepped the men who had spoken all wearing black suits and high hats of silk and mustaches as dark as the tips of their boots we said the first will added the second reward spoke the third him finished the fourth and each drew a purse from his pocket at the very same moment gray ears put down the card and lifting both me and the vines from his back laid the queer-looking bundle at the feet of the four no sooner had he done so than i thrust the branches aside jumped to my toes and bowed low to those at whose feet i had been placed who may you be exclaimed the four in surprise why the one who found gray ears i cried in reply none other than diggledy dan now at the sight of my face and my polka dot suit and the sounds of my tingling name all the children 
immediately rose in their seats and began to shout and sing oh dan dan diggledy dan oh dan dan diggledy dan do play some pranks for us diggledy dan but at this the four frowned and held up four separate hands whereat the three ringmasters again cracked their whips and called for all to be silent and then the four opened their purses no no not a penny cried i as i watched them for it's not that kind of a reward that i'd like best to request aha said the first oh ho went the second what then queried the third is your wish asked the last just to stay with you always i answered the four of them to be one of your clowns to cut pranks for the children and sometimes see gray ears the elephant granted most gladly each and all of them cried while the children added their welcome this very night you shall take your place with the rest so make ready at once to join with them i answered this speech with another low bow and then skipped to where gray ears was standing at a nod of his head i mounted his foot and held fast to his knee while amid shouts of delight from the children the big fellow set off in very grand style toward his home in the menagerie tent gray ears i questioned as we came almost to it now do tell me what it was you said to the watchman and what it was you whispered in the policeman's right ear why began he but see what is happening there on down the tent what I saw, as I looked, was whole dozens of clowns pouring in through the curtain we had passed when we came. Peal after peal of merriest laughter attended the sight of them, but amid it and the music we could hear voices calling. Oh, Dan, Dan, Diggledy Dan, where's Dan, Dan, Diggledy Dan? what i whispered said gray ears again answering my question was simply the children are waiting for us and from the sound of the shouts that are now greeting our ears i think i wasn't far wrong so go now go to those who are calling your name as he finished he gave me a gentle shove with his trunk and turned to go into the menagerie tent while i skipped gaily away to join the rest of the clowns and with that ended dan you have heard the whole of my story did gray ears ever run away any more asked camel time's up time's up called hippo who had on this day been placed in charge of the watch away to your places then ordered diggledy dan and to-morrow we'll meet once again for though my tale's at an end we may safely depend that another will soon follow after end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the adventures of diggledy dan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california the adventures of diggledy dan by edwin p norwood chapter seventeen in which the animals entertain an unexpected caller 
In Spangle Land's realm are many massive blue poles, and among the biggest of these are those that stand in the center of the menagerie tent. Between the bases of two of them is a broad open space, and it was here all the animals were gathered at twilight on the day following that upon which had ended the tale of gray ears the elephant and i'm sure all remember your very last words lion was saying to diggledy dan as i recall them they ran something like this for though my tale's at an end we may safely depend that another will soon follow after exactly said dan and now comes the question as to who's to provide the next story but to the clown's great surprise not a single animal made answer my goodness he cried as he swung around on hippo's vast back the better to be able to face them do you mean to say that not one of you has thought of a story why mr president i am indeed astounded oh now dan don't be talking like that protested monkey i know a lot of stories only i just can't remember them right now and those i know are all so very old pleaded great white bear while all the rest seemed ready to excuse themselves on much the same score well said the lion in view of all this there seems to be but one thing to do and that is to put on our thinking caps and not take them off until each has thought of a story so let us get down to business at once tiger you will kindly come forward and stretch yourself on the ground there that is the way now then do you slowly wave your tail from one side to the other exactly you dan will keep count of the tail waves until you have recorded exactly one hundred and until that number is reached there's not to be a word from a one of you instead you are to keep silent and think all ready now go at this word of command tiger's tail began to rise and to fall and dan's head to nod down and then up as he kept exact track of the waves of it quite at the same time all the others solemnly puckered their brows half closed their eyes or pillowed their chins as folks always do when they engage in deep thought time passed tiger's tail floated up and down through the air dan's head continued to bob and to count lion gazed about with so severe an eye that hardly an animal dared breathe not a sound broke the silence and then of a sudden tap 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 now the taps were not specially loud and aside from that fact there is as a rule nothing particularly unusual about an innocent tap nor for that matter about two nor yet three of them but in this case you see everything was so very still with even monkey not so much as uttering a sound that tap 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 there it was again and oddest of all it seemed to come from a point high over their heads tap 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 and at this you may be sure the business of thinking of stories was entirely forgotten instead every ear was alert it now seemed certain that the taps had come 
from the top of the biggest blue hole. Ahoy! Whoever you are, what is it you want? called Lion as he directed his eyes and his voice toward the point in the roof where the pole passed through to the skies. Tap, tap, tap came the answer. Come in, roared Lion. Come in at once, whatever you are and wherever you are. Let me skip up the side of the pole and see just what it can be, cried Monkey. But just at that moment there came a muffled voice from the roof, a voice that was something between a call and a croak. Menagerie tent, Spangle land, it called down. Yes, Mr. Voice, you are in Spangle land and this is the menagerie tent answered lion and now if you will be so good as to come out of hiding but even while lion was speaking a movement was seen and with it appeared two very black feet these were followed by the underside of an even blacker body with a long pointed beak coming after and thus, bit by bit, there gradually emerged the whole of a crow of quite remarkable size. Now those who gazed upward at this strange visitor were immediately struck by three most unusual things. In the first place, their caller's head was almost wholly concealed by a messenger's cap that was much too large for him. Secondly, he walked down the side of the pole, when to have flown would have been a far simpler way. And thirdly, instead of showing some interest in his surroundings as he entered, he preferred to bury his nose in the crook of what must have been a most entertaining book indeed he did not once look up until he had set his feet on the ground and then it was to find himself surrounded by all the animals lion lion mr lion he inquired rather briskly as he tucked his book under one wing and scanned the many faces at your service responded lion as he stepped forward yes sir yes sir message for you sir and removing his cap with something of a flourish the crow took a bit of folded paper from out of the crown of it well well exclaimed lion as he opened the missive and glanced at its contents though addressed in my care it's really for all of us. Yes, but what is it? cried the animals. Why, a message from the pretty lady with the blue, blue eyes. Here is what she says. Care of Lion, Menagerie Tent, Spangled Land. I and my white, white horse will be quite near you at half-past twilight on the morrow so please be at home for it is very likely we will pay you a visit the pretty lady oh hurrah hurrah shouted all the animals in one breath while dan clapped his hands with much glee you are indeed a most welcome messenger remarked lion as he turned to where the crow had been standing but to his surprise the sombre chap in the cap was no longer there instead he had perched himself on a wheel of giraffe's spacious home yes there he sat once more reading his book and in addition was now slowly munching an apple i say repeated lion a most welcome messenger and this time he laid so much stress